Did God cause the fall of Adam and Eve? Was there rebellion against his commandments according to or contrary to his plan for their lives? Was it the will of God for them to walk down the pathway of iniquity or the trail of transgression? In order to answer these questions, we need to go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created mankind in his image, according to Genesis 1.26. That means just as God has the power of thought or intelligence, and God has the power of feelings or emotions, and God has the power of self-determination or free will, so did mankind created in his image. We were created with all the necessary faculties of uh, free moral agency, all the necessary conditions of being subjects to his moral government. God created Adam and Eve morally innocent, and now they were free to determine for themselves what their character would be. If they choose what is good, they would form good moral character. If they choose what is evil, they would form evil moral character. So God created their constitution and gave them free will, but they themselves would create their moral character by how they use their free will. Since God created Adam and Eve capable of virtue and vice, God gave them a moral law in order to influence their choices. The moral law was not at all impossible for them to keep since they were created in the image of God. Now God gave them the opportunity of being obedient or disobedient by giving them a law. By forbidding the tree of knowledge, God gave Adam and Eve the opportunity of forming good moral character. See, God did not place them in the garden with the forbidden tree so that they would become disobedient, but so that they would have the opportunity of being obedient. By granting Adam and Eve the freedom of doing what is wrong, God was actually giving them the freedom of doing what is right. See, God gave them this opportunity for evil because he wanted them to do the right thing and to form good moral character. A person only has good moral character if they could do what is wrong, but they freely choose to do what is right instead. In this way, temptation can be considered a good thing. And that's why James 1.2 says, we ought to count it a joy when we are tempted. Because James 1.12 says, there is a blessing for those who overcome. So the opportunity to do what is wrong is a good thing because every opportunity to do what is wrong is an opportunity to do what is right. Clement of Rome was a companion of the Apostle Paul. In fact, Paul endorsed Clement in the scriptures in Philippians 4.3. He said Clement was a fellow laborer in the gospel and that his name was written in the book of life. This is what Clement had to say on this topic. But you say, God ought to have made us at first so that we should not have thought at all of such things. You who say this do not know what is free will and how it is possible to be really good. That he who is good by his own choice is really good. But he who is made good by another under necessity is not really good because he is not what he is by his own choice. Since therefore everyone's freedom constitutes the true good and shows the true evil, God has contrived that friendship or hostility should be in each man by occasions. But no, it is said, everything that we think he makes us think. Stop! Why do you blaspheme more and more in saying this? For if we are under his influence in all that we think, you say that he is the cause of fornications, lust, a variance, and all blasphemy. Cease your evil speaking. Ye he ought to speak well of him, and to bestow all honor upon him. While God gave Adam and Eve the ability to sin by giving them a free will, and God gave them the opportunity to sin by placing them in the garden with the forbidden tree, it was not God who actually tempted them to sin in the sense of suggesting it to their minds. In fact, James 1.13 says the Lord does not tempt anyone with evil. And Luke 11.4 says we ought to pray for God to lead us away from temptation. But God wanted them to have the opportunity of being genuinely faithful and loyal to Him, just as God allowed the, uh, Satan to tempt Job, not to destroy his character, but to prove his character. So God allowed Satan to tempt Adam and Eve, 
not so that they would do the wrong thing, but so that they would do the right thing, so that they could form good moral character. It was the serpent, according to Genesis 3, who actually tempted them to sin. But the Bible says God commanded them not to. And of course, God is completely sincere in His commandments. He really did want them to obey Him. God created Adam and Eve with the ability to sin or not to sin. That's why God commanded them not to sin and the devil tempted them to sin. It would make no sense for God to command them to do what they cannot do or for the devil to suggest that they should do that which cannot be done. See, God knew that they were capable of obedience and that's why he commanded obedience from them. And the devil knew that they were capable of disobedience and that's why he tempted them to be disobedient. Now God put forth effort to influence man not to sin. But despite the effort and influence of God, man chose to sin anyways. It's not that God had failed man, but man had failed God. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. See, Adam and Eve sought to gratify natural desires that God had given them through unnatural and unlawful means, which God had not designed or planned for them. Mankind was created for a relationship with God, but now through sin, that relationship was disrupted and disturbed. So we read in Genesis 3.8, because of their sin, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. You can almost hear the pain in God's heart and the grief in His voice when He said in Genesis 3.13, What is this that thou hast done? But as the one who had created them as free moral agents, as the one who gave them a moral law, and as the one who is responsible for the well-being of his creation, God as the moral governor of the universe had to call them into account for their actions. And they were justifiably held responsible since the moral law God had given them was not at all impossible for them to keep. Just as there are self-evident truths, there's also self-evident falsehoods. A good God authoring sin is a self-evident falsehood. Jesus stated this truth in Matthew 7, 18, when he said, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. See, God is good, and therefore he's not the author of evil. And the devil is evil, and therefore he is not the author of good. We know that Adam and Eve were not created with a sinful nature. Because Genesis 1.31 says, God created everything very good. And 1 Timothy 4.4 4 says, every creature of God is good. And Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, God has made men upright. See, God created man with a good nature. But the relationship between nature and will is not causation, but influence. See, their good nature did not force them to do what was good. Neither did their nature force them to do what was evil. Doing good or doing evil was a matter of their own free choice, not a matter of their nature. You see, if their nature necessitated their choices, they never would have sinned. But if their nature does necessitate their choice, and yet they sinned, we must conclude God had given them a sinful nature. See, the only way to account for the sin of Adam and Eve, without making God the author of it, is to understand that they sinned by their own free will and not by the necessity of their nature. In Isaiah 14, 13 to 14, we read that Lucifer sinned not by the nature God had created him with, but by the freedom of his own will. This is what it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High." See, Lucifer sinned because of his will, not because of his nature. And so, so with the sin of Adam and Eve. They sinned not because of their nature, but by their free will. In fact, they chose not according to their nature, but they chose contrary to their nature. The freedom of the will that they had 
means that they were free to determine their choices according to or contrary to the nature that God had given them. There are those who teach that Adam and Eve did not have the power or the ability to obey the law that God had given them and that their sin was not the result of them misusing their free will but that God caused them to sin by His secret, eternal, and sovereign will. John Calvin said, The first man fell because the Lord deemed it meet that he should. Martin Luther said, This is the highest degree of faith, to believe that he is merciful, the very one who saves so few and damns so many, to believe that he is just, the one who according to his own will makes us necessarily damnable. Where did Martin Luther get the idea that man's sinfulness was according to God's will or that God makes us necessarily damnable? He didn't get it from the scriptures. It's not found anywhere between Genesis and Revelations. You see, God does not make us damnable because God does not make us sinful. Men make themselves damnable because men make themselves sinful. The very reason that men deserve punishment is because they are freely choosing to sin. Sin is not the result of God's predetermination. Sin is the result of man's own free will. While I was street preaching outside of a club in Ottawa, Canada, a girl said to me, God wants me to be out here. God wants me to have fun. God wants me to get drunk. Now, looking back on that situation, I realized, ultimately, she was teaching Calvinism. John Calvin said, Creatures are so governed by the secret counsel of God that nothing happens but what He has knowingly and willingly decreed. Of course, this girl had a point. How could I rebuke her for her sin if her sin was the will of God? How could I call her to repent of her sin if her sin was necessitated and unavoidable because of the eternal decrees of the Lord. I have often wondered, why would a Calvinist get upset with me for rejecting Calvinism or for speaking against Calvinism when my actions are not caused by my own free will, but are caused by the sovereign will of God? Why would they get upset with me, for example, making a video like this one, when every word in this video, according to their view, was predestined before the foundations of the world. If every word spoken in this video is caused by the immutable and irresistible sovereign will of God. By getting upset with the content of this video, they're really getting upset with the will of God. They shouldn't be getting upset with me, since my actions are not caused by my own free will. They should be getting upset with the Lord. I have also wondered how any lover of holiness could be expected to accept Calvinism when Calvinism says God prefers sin over holiness in every instance that sin occurs. God could have decreed holiness in those situations, but He chose to decree sin instead. God could have had a sinless universe, but He preferred having a sinful universe. So if a believer wants the whole world to be perfectly holy and obedient to God, are they being more loving and more righteous than God is? But if, if God wants sin to exist, then we too should want sin to exist. If God wants men to be sinful, then we too should want men to be sinful. But if God wants men to be sinful and we don't, then we're ungodly. Imagine that. If Calvinism is true, a person is ungodly if they don't want sin to exist. According to Brown's Dictionary of the Bible, the Nicolaitans imputed their wickedness to God as the cause. Jesus said, The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Jesus hated their doctrine. And is there any doctrine more worthy of our hatred or more deserving of our abhorrence than the doctrine that says God is the author of sin? But when Paul asked the question in Galatians 2.17, Is Christ the minister of sin? He firmly and quickly responded with, God forbid. Yet ultimately, Calvinism says that God is the author of sin. If God commanded Adam and Eve not to sin, when He secretly wanted them to sin, 
then God was misrepresenting his own character while misleading and deceiving Adam and Eve by giving them false impressions. You see, truthfulness is the foundation of trustworthiness. But what confidence can you have in the character of a being who doesn't even mean what he says? It may be simplistic, but it's true that the mere fact that God commanded them not to sin and that he warned them about the negative consequences if they do sin is proof positive that God didn't want them to sin, but that they sinned contrary to his will and despite God's influence in their lives. While Calvinists say that God decreed the existence of sin, the God of the Bible said in Isaiah 10:1, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. You see, God's decree regarding sin is found in Exodus chapter 20, where he said, Thou shalt not. God said, Thou shalt not, and he means it. But Calvinism makes God insincere in his commandments. But if James tells us that God does not even tempt anyone to do evil, how could we ever conclude that God causes us to do what is evil? You see, God is not the author of sin. We are. God didn't want sin to exist at all. The very reason that God calls sinners to repent of their sin, and the reason that he punishes them for their sin, is because sin was not his plan from the beginning. God's plan was for us to be holy. It would make no sense to rebuke sin if sin was God's plan, because then we would be rebuking God's plan. It would make no sense to be upset with sin if sin was God's plan, because then we would be upset with the plan of God. But all throughout the Bible, we see God's condemnation of sin. Is God condemning the fruit of his own hands? Is God condemning the result of his own activity? Does God condemn his secret and sovereign will when he condemns sin? See, I've asked Calvinists this series of questions. Is God angry and grieved with sin? As the Bible clearly says, Psalms 7:11 and Genesis 6, 5 to 6. And Calvinists will say, yes, God is angry and grieved with sin. And then I'll ask them, is sin the plan of God? And they'll say, yes, sin was his secret will. Sin is his sovereign plan. And then I'll ask them, so is God angry and grieved with his own secret and sovereign will? And they don't know how to answer that. They're always silent. Because if you put it in a logical syllogism that grants their premise that sin is God's plan, and that God is angry and grieved with sin, then you logically and unavoidably conclude that God is angry and grieved with his own plan. If God is angry and grieved with sin, then God should be angry and grieved with himself because he's the one who caused it through his eternal decrees. You see, sin is not self-existent, but to be angry with sin and not to be angry with the one who causes the sin would make no sense at all. The Bible expressly says in Ecclesiastes 7.29, Lo, this only have I found, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. This verse clearly shows that God is not responsible for the existence of sin, but that sin is entirely the fault of man. Yet John Calvin actually blamed God for the existence of sin. John Calvin said, I freely acknowledge my doctrine to be this, that Adam fell not only by the permission of God, but by his very secret counsel and decree. What John Calvin said is utterly opposed to the revelation the Bible gives us regarding God's character and will. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Psalms 145.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. James 1.17 The just Lord will not do iniquity. Zephaniah 3.5 To do means to accomplish, advance, appoint, bring forth, provide, make, or procure, according to Strong's definitions. And BDB definitions says to produce or ordain. That means that the just Lord will not make, procure, produce, or ordain iniquity. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Deuteronomy 
32.4 Therefore hearken unto me, you men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. Job 34.10 Yea, surely God will not do wickedly. Job 34.12 Who can say, Thou hast wrought iniquity? Job 36.23 to wrought iniquity means to make or ordain it, according to Strong's definitions. How could we say, I will ascribe righteousness to my Maker, as Job 36.3 says, if He is the Maker of sin? How could we praise God for His holiness, saying, Holy, 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 as in Revelation 4.8, if He's the reason that all unholiness exists? How could we worship God at all, if sin is His fault? If God has a secret counsel or a secret will, then God has something to hide. But the God of the Bible willingly welcomes the examination of his character, knowing that he has done nothing wrong at all and has absolutely nothing to hide. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Jeremiah 2.5 O oh my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Micah 6.3 And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Isaiah 5.3 God actually invites men to judge and to testify against him, knowing that no man can find fault with his moral character. God is so confident in his character and in the moral sense that he has placed within man that he doesn't discourage man from judging him and testifying against him, but God actually encourages it. God places his works before the minds of moral beings so that they could see the righteousness of his ways. And when we see the moral character of God as it truly is, then we see how praiseworthy and how trustworthy God actually is. R.C. Sproul Jr. said that God wanted Adam and Eve to sin because he wanted objects for his wrath. He said that God gave them sinful desires so that they would choose sin and thus become objects of his wrath. He then went on to say, I am not accusing God of sinning. I am suggesting that he created sin. As if creating sin and sinning are two different things. What is a sinner? A sinner is someone who creates sin. When a moral being creates iniquity, they are sinning and they become a sinner. And therefore, to accuse God of creating sin is actually to accuse God of sinning. But Zephaniah 3.5 says, The Lord will not make or fashion iniquity. Now consider this in a logical syllogism. A sinner is someone who creates sin. The God of Calvinism created sin. And therefore, the God of Calvinism is a sinner. Now it is self-evident that a sinner is someone who causes sin to exist, someone who chooses to bring about its existence. In fact, the biblical phrase, a worker of iniquity, according to Strong's definition, is someone who makes or ordains sin. Now the God of Calvinism makes and ordains sin, and therefore the God of Calvinism is a sinner, according to the scripture's definition of a worker of iniquity. If Adam sinned because God forced him to, then Adam is not really a sinner at all, because what he did was not his own free will choice. You see, Adam would actually be a victim of God's divine bullying, or a victim of God's divine marionette show. But he wouldn't be a sinner deserving of punishment, he would be deserving of pity. He wouldn't be a sinner deserving of condemnation, he would be deserving of compassion. But if God causes all the sins of all men, then really God is the only sinner in all of the universe. That's because God is the one that causes all of the sins of all of the universe. And we would not be responsible or accountable for our actions at all. God and God alone would have moral character because God's the only one who causes moral choices to occur.
Now, if a man takes a gun and kills his neighbor, the courts are not going to hold the gun responsible or send the, the gun to prison. The man, the man will be on trial because the man's the one who had control of the gun. And in the same way, if we're just puppets in the hands of the divine, then we are not responsible for anything that we do, but God and God alone is at fault. While Adam blamed his wife for his sin in Genesis 3.12, and the wife blamed the serpent for her sin in Genesis 3.13, God blamed each individual for their sin, which shows that each individual was the cause of their own sin. Has thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Genesis 3.11 This scripture shows us that their sin of eating of the tree was their own fault. They were the ones that did it, not God. In fact, God was not to be blamed at all. God commanded them not to do it, he said. And of course, God is completely sincere in his commandments. He went on to say, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thine wife. Genesis 3.17 God blamed Adam for his sin. It was his own choice or his own volition. He chose to hearken unto his wife. God said to Eve, What is this that thou hast done? Genesis 3.13 God blamed Eve for her sin. He said, what is this that you have done? It was not God's fault or the serpent's fault or Adam's fault. Her sin was her own fault. It was her own volition. God said to the serpent, because thou has done this. Genesis 3.14 Before assigning the consequences of their sin to them, God made sure he said that it was their own fault that they had sinned. If it wasn't their own fault, but if it was God's fault, then they couldn't be punished for their sins at all. But moral beings, with the power and freedom of choice, are rightly held responsible and punishable for their actions, because what they did, they did of their own volition. To deny that mankind has genuinely rebelled and revolted against the divine will is actually to deny the fall of man, because if sin is God's plan, then man has not rebelled against his plan, and thus they're not rebels. If sinners have not disobeyed God's will, but are actually sinning in accordance with his will, then sinners are obedient servants of his will. Sinners are simply puppets in the hands of the divine. Now, it doesn't solve the problem or the dilemma to say that God has a revealed will and a secret will. Because if God's revealed will is holiness, but God's secret will is sin, then God's revealed will is really an insincere lie. But the Bible says quite clearly, God cannot lie. Therefore, if God says he doesn't want us to sin, then he means it. But if God publicly favors righteousness, while he secretly favors or prefers sin, what kind of a being is he? You see, a person is what they are in secret. A person's character is what they do in secret. If God secretly prefers sin, if God secretly decreed sin, then God would actually be a sinner. But this is not what the Bible says. Isaiah 45, 19 says, I have not spoken in secret, in a dark place of the earth. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. If God's revealed will is what is right, and if God had a secret will, which was the opposite of his revealed will, then his secret will would be wrong. If God's revealed will is righteous, and he has a secret will which is contrary and opposed to that revealed will, then that secret will would be unrighteous. But if God was in the habit of publicly saying one thing, but not really meaning what he says, but actually wanting the opposite of what he says, then how could we trust anything that he commands us or tells us? We could never trust any of his promises in the gospel. We could never trust any of his threatenings in the law. We couldn't, we couldn't trust anything that's written in the Bible. In fact, if God was in the habit of saying the opposite of the truth, then we might believe that the opposite of the Bible is true. God might say Jesus is the only way, but secretly there's many ways, or secretly Jesus isn't a way at all.
You see, there's so many problems with this idea that God has a secret will, which is contrary to and opposed to His revealed will. After one young convert heard a Calvinist describing Calvinism, he said, your God is my devil. Now that's a strong statement, but there's a lot of truth to that. You see, God's plan for man was holiness. The devil's plan for man was sin. And the world chose to go with the devil's plan. That's why the Bible describes the devil as the prince of this world in John 12, 31. And the Bible even calls him the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. There is a real war going on between God and the devil for the allegiance of man's will. God commanded man to be obedient and the devil tempted man to sin. And that's why to say that sin was God's will is to confuse God with the devil. Now, if it is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, according to Matthew 12, to credit the works of the Spirit to the devil, then it must equally be blasphemy to credit the works of the devil to God himself. Consider how this false theology actually makes you feel bad for the devil and to have sympathy for the demons, because they too are merely marionettes in the hands of the divine. Martin Luther said, Since therefore, God moves and does all in all. He necessarily moves and does all in Satan and the wicked man. So God forces the devil to sin. Then God punishes him for doing what he himself caused him to do. Poor devil! You see, this theology makes you take blame off of the devil and put it on God. But if the devil is a free moral agent with the freedom of will, then all blame is removed from God entirely and placed totally on the devil. It means that the devil is evil, but God is good. Now, it's no wonder John Wesley, in view of this theology, said this. Predestination destroys all the attributes of God, His justice, mercy, and truth. Yea, it represents the most holy God as worse than the devil, as both more false, more cruel, and more unjust. You see, the devil can only tempt us to sin, but Calvinism says that God causes us to sin. And that's why Wesley said Calvinism makes God out to be worse than the devil because even the actions of the devil are caused by God. Now, Theodore Beza was the successor and friend of John Calvin. Theodore Beza said this, The fall of man was both necessary and wonderful. See, Calvinists have taught that God predestined the sin of mankind and consequently the damnation of mankind, so that God could then get the glory of bringing about the atonement in order to save the few that have been chosen. Xantius said, Both the elect and the reprobates were foreordained to sin, as sin, that the glory of God might be declared thereby. In Romans 3.8, the Bible explicitly condemns the principle that we should do evil that good may come. And yet this is precisely what Calvinism teaches. Cornelius Van Til said, It was God's will that sin should come into the world. He wished to enhance His glory by means of its punishment and removal. This would be like a policeman who wants citizens to become criminals so that he could then show his goodness by arresting them. Or it would be like a judge who wants people to commit crimes against the community so that he could then show his justice in sending them to prison. It would be like a fireman who goes around town secretly starting fires, which, which takes the lives of hundreds of people so that he could then publicly come and put the fire out and be treated by the community as a hero and get glory for his actions. But if the community knew that he's the one who started the fire, they wouldn't praise him for putting it out. Now if God caused the sin of mankind so that he could then cause the redemption of the elect, then he's just like that fireman who secretly starts fires. It means he wouldn't truly deserve to be praised. He wouldn't truly deserve glory and honor. It would be like a mother who makes her children sick so that she would feel needed and she could come and comfort them 
care for them and nurse them back to health. See, that action is unloving. That's, that's selfish. That's even sadistic. Now imagine God causing the sin of the world so that he could cause the redemption of the elect. That's to paint God out to be a monster. That's to blaspheme the character of God and to take away the honor and glory that he truly deserves. Calvinists imply that the fall of Adam was part of God's plan by saying, didn't God plan the atonement of Christ before the fall of Adam happened? And the answer to this question is both yes and no. You see, God was prepared in the same way an airline is prepared for a crash by putting parachutes on the plane. But just because they put parachutes on the plane doesn't mean that they are planning to actually crash it. This is a precautionary measure knowing the possible danger. And in the same way, the Bible says Christ was ordained before the foundation of the world in 1 Peter 1.20. God knew the possible danger because God gave man a free will, so he was prepared for the possible fall of Adam. But it says in Revelation 13.8 that Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. You see, the Bible distinguishes between Christ being ordained before the fall and Christ being slain from the fall because it was at the foundation of the world that the fall of man actually happened. And so God was prepared knowing the possible danger. But that doesn't mean that God actually planned the fall of mankind. In fact, the atonement is not spoken of in definite terms until after the, the fall of Adam occurred. And that's in Genesis 3.15 when God said that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. God was ready for the fall of Adam, but that doesn't mean God caused the fall of Adam. We must remember that the Bible says God prefers having a holy people over having sacrifices. To obey is better than sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15:22. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Proverbs 21:3. In light of these passages, that to obey is better than sacrifice, and that to do what is good is more acceptable to God than sacrifice, it should be blatantly obvious that God would have preferred having a sinless universe that needed no atonement at all than to have a sinful universe that needed the atonement. You see, God created everything good, and He wanted it to stay that way. God didn't want His universe to rebel against Him. God didn't want men or angels to fall away from His plan. God's will for men and for angels has been always holiness. Calvinists will even interpret and misuse the Bible to teach that God is the author of sin. For example, their turn to Isaiah 45.7 that says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So for the unlearned Bible reader, it might look like this is a verse that teaches God is the author of sin. But notice that what is contrasted with evil is not righteousness, but what is contrasted with evil is peace. That's because the evil spoken of in this text, in the Hebrew, is calamity. In many places, God talks about bringing evil to a city, and the context is clearly judgment, calamity, or destruction. And so when God says that he makes peace and he makes evil, that doesn't mean he authors sin. It means that he gives peace to the righteous, but he brings destruction to the wicked. And so this verse should not be used to teach that God is the author of sin, because this verse doesn't teach that. In fact, in many places all throughout the Bible, God commanded his people to put away evil from among them. That's because evil was not God's plan for them. God's plan for his people is holiness. The Bible teaches that God is angry and grieved with sin. And the Bible teaches that God loves righteousness but hates iniquity. God is pleased with men when they live holy. And the Bible also says we were created for the pleasure of God. Therefore, if we are created for the pleasure of God, 
and God takes pleasure in righteousness and takes no pleasure in sin, then we can conclude that God did not create us to sin, but God created us to be righteous. Certainly, God didn't create us to do what He hates. God created us for His own pleasure. The Bible says God regretted the creation of our race when He saw how we became sinful. And hell, the Bible says, was not created for mankind. So sin was not in God's mind when He created man, neither was hell in God's mind when He created man. Since the Bible says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. So we can conclude then that God does not create men to sin and to go to hell because God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. As the Bible clearly says, For thou art not a God that has pleasure in wickedness. Consider these truths in logical syllogism. Mankind was created for the pleasure of God. God has no pleasure in wickedness. Therefore man was not created to be wicked. We were created for the pleasure of God. God is pleased when men live holy. Therefore mankind was created to live holy. We were created for the pleasure of God. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And therefore mankind was not created to be damned. If God's will was always done, sin never would exist and no man would ever be damned. But the fact that sin does exist and that sinners are damned is proof of the resistible will of God and proof of the freedom of man's will. Sin was actually an interruption into the plan of God. God did not create men to sin. God did not create men to be damned. So God's will has been revolted against. God's will has been rebelled against. But this is contrary to what Calvinists teach. Tucker said, sin or moral evil is a wise and holy ordination of God. Not an impure thought, word, or act, more or less, can arise among the creatures than God has actually determined the being and permission of. Omnipotence cannot pervade or absolute wisdom guide his arm if anything comes to pass and he commands it not. In other words, Calvinism is saying that sin is the commandment of God, rather than what the Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, that sin is transgression of His commandments. Tucker asked this question, Does or can anything come to pass and the Lord command it not? We should let the Lord Himself answer this question in vindication of His character. In the Bible, when men would worship false gods, God would say that they were doing that which He commanded them not. And the dad and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Leviticus 10.1 and has gone and served other gods, and worshipped them, either the sun, or moon, or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded. Deuteronomy 17.3 In other words, they were not doing what he had commanded them to do, but they were revolting against his commandments. So to answer Tucker's question, can anything happen which the Lord commanded not? God specifically said that Israel, in worshiping false gods, were doing that which He commanded them not. When Israel would sacrifice their children to false gods, God said that they did that which I commanded them not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Jeremiah 19.5 Again, when Israel would sacrifice their children to false gods, God said that they did which I commanded them not, 
neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination. Jeremiah 32, 35. If God planned and decreed that Israel would worship false gods and that they would sacrifice their children to false gods, then God could not say in all honesty that they were doing that which He commanded them not, nor that they were doing that which He didn't even think they would do. In fact, if God had planned their sin from all of eternity's past, God could not say, neither did it enter into my mind that they would do this abomination. Now the Westminster Catechism says, God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass. But if God says, neither came it into my mind that they would do this, and neither did I command them that they should do this, then God certainly has not decreed whatsoever comes to pass. Either God is lying, or the Westminster Catechism is false, but they both can't possibly be true. God told Israel in Ezekiel 20 verse 43, Ye shall loathe yourself in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. But how could Israel loathe themselves in their own sight for their sin, if their sin was not caused by their own free will, but was caused by God? You see, our minds cannot blame or condemn us for that which we didn't cause. Men cannot be properly blamed for sin unless men are the ultimate cause of their sin. But if God is the cause of our sin, how could we possibly loathe ourselves for them? In Ezekiel 20.31, when Israel was sacrificing their children to idols, God said that they were polluting themselves. But how could God say that they were polluting themselves through their sin if God was actually the one causing their sin and therefore God being the one that actually polluted them? You see, God cannot charge them with being guilty of what He Himself is causing. If God's the one polluting them, God couldn't say that they polluted themselves. But by blaming them and by blaming them alone, God was clearing Himself from all responsibility. But Calvinism, or Reformed theology, actually blames God with all of the child sacrifices of history. In fact, it blames God with all of the abortions of history. Yet in Proverbs 6, 16-17, God speaks very differently of His character when He says that He hates the hands that shed innocent blood. It's no wonder that many Christians considered Calvinistic or Reformed theology to actually be deformed theology. That's because Calvinism does not exalt God, it insults Him. Their doctrine of the sovereignty of God is really nothing more than a mockery to God. See, the doctrine of free will says that man is to be blamed for sin. But the Calvinistic doctrine of sovereignty says that God is the author of sin. And yet somehow, the former is considered to be heretical, while the latter is considered to be orthodox by some. Well, if it's heresy to believe that man is to be blamed for sin and not God, well then you can call me a happy heretic. While the Bible says in Zephaniah 3.5, as we already saw, that the Lord will not make, fashion, work, or ordain iniquity, John Calvin contradicted this when he said the following, Whatever things are done wrongly and unjustly by man, these very things are the right and just works of God. So the Bible says God will not make or fashion iniquity, and yet John Calvin said that sin was the work of God. So either the Bible is right or John Calvin is right. But the Bible and John Calvin cannot both be right because they're saying totally opposite things. James White is a modern apologist for the Calvinistic or Reformed faith. And he gave us an example of what John Calvin would consider the right and just works of God. James White was asked, when a child is raped, is God responsible? And did He decree that rape? James White answered, yes. In Calvinism, all sinful actions are the just and right works of God. In my mind, this would make both the child and the rapist victims of God's fatalistic will. Consider the consequences of such a view.
If we pray, Thy will be done, as the Bible teaches us to, then we're actually praying for children to be raped. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray for children to be raped, because Jesus taught us to pray, Thy will be done. How could any Christian ever pray after thinking that? Now the reason that we're supposed to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven is because God's will is supposed to be better than what is occurring on earth, not because what is occurring on earth is already His will. The best criminal defense a person could have in court would be, God made me do it. It's not my fault. But is God really the mastermind behind all the crimes of our society? When crimes are prosecuted, is it really the works of God that are being prosecuted? When sin is condemned, is it really the works of God that are being condemned? You can forget about praying, lead us not into temptation, as the Bible teaches us to. God straight out forces us into sin. Remember what Martin Luther said? Since, therefore, God moves and does all in all, He necessarily moves and does all in Satan and the wicked man. Luther also said, God worketh all things in all men, even wickedness in the wicked. Are we really to blame God for all the sins of our race? Think of all the awful stories you've ever heard on the news. Is God to be blamed for all of the tragedies of history? For all the children that have been uh, kidnapped? All the girls that have been sold into the sex trade? For all the people that have been killed by drunk drivers? Or all the people that have committed suicide? Is God the cause of all these things? Now in the Bible, God is not the cause of sin. God is not such a heinous monster as that, but mankind, through their own sin, mankind, through the freedom of their will, have become a heinous monster, and that we have acted not in accordance with God's will, but we have revolted and rebelled against it. So no, God is not to be blamed for all the tragedies of history. Man is to be blamed for all the sins that man has done. If God decreed sin, God would be sending people to hell for doing His will. But in the Bible, we don't see God sending people to hell for doing His will. We see people going to hell for rebelling against His will. The Bible teaches us to pray in Matthew 6.10, Thy will be done. This prayer presupposes that God's will is not always being done on earth. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 7.30 that they rejected the counsel of God against themselves. This verse teaches us that God's will can be resisted by man's will. A perfect example of this is the nation of Israel. Israel was God's vineyard, and He cultivated His vineyard to bring forth good grapes. But God was disappointed with His vineyard because they brought forth wild grapes instead. He looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Isaiah 5, 1-4 See, God willed that one thing would happen, and instead something else happened. God's will in this instance was not done. God's will in this instance was not accomplished. This is because the Bible goes on to say this, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. We see quite clearly that God's will is not always being done. This is because God created man as a free moral agent with the power of self-determination. God's will is not the only will in the universe. We see this when the ministry of Jesus Christ, when Jesus said the following, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wing, and ye would not. <laughs>
You see, Jesus Christ wanted to gather them unto himself, but they were not willing to be gathered unto him. And so we see that man's will was resisting God's will. Because man's will is free, therefore God's will is resistible. But despite all these plain examples of man's will resisting God's will, these clear examples of God's will not being done, Calvinists have said things like this. What God does not will to be done cannot be done, and what He wills must be done. Nothing could be any plainer in the Bible but that the will of God is not always done. John Benson said, There is no scriptural evidence for asserting that God decreed the existence and entrance of sin. The doctrine is based upon Stoic philosophy, logical argument, perverted scripture, and human assertions. But as for a thus saith the Lord for the doctrine, there is no such thing to be found between the backs of the Bible. John Calvin said that God not only foresaw the fall of the first man and in him the ruin of his posterity, but also at his own pleasure arranged it. The Bible expressly describes the great heartache and disappointment that God had with the fall of our race. In Genesis 6, 5-6, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So what John Calvin said, that God arranged the fall of mankind for his own pleasure, cannot possibly be true, since the Bible describes God's great heartache and disappointment with the fall of mankind. You see, it didn't bring God pleasure, because it wasn't God's plan. God takes pleasure in righteousness, and God takes pleasure in holiness, but God is deeply grieved with sin. Gordon C. Olson said, Beloved, when God had made such glorious and blessed plans for his creature man, and man had forsaken the great heart of God for sinful pleasure, and further grew worse and worse, can we form any conception of the sorrow and grief that came upon the blessed Trinity when they saw such wickedness? And further, when God contemplated man's glorious endowments, created so that man might fellowship with and understand his Creator, now being used to devise means of sinful gratification, who can measure God's sorrow? M. W. Gifford said, A being cannot be infinite in goodness that does not desire the happiness of every intelligent being and feel an interest in its welfare. God must, therefore, be mindful of man, or he cannot be God. You see, God is a real person with real experiences. God has real pains and real pleasures. God is genuinely grieved over the sin of our race, and God genuinely rejoices when sinners are brought to repentance. You see, we should not project upon the Hebrew God these Greek ideas of perfection. God is not an impassable being that is unaffected by the world He has made, but God has taken a great interest and a deep concern in His creatures. God is an infinite being. His love for righteousness is infinite. His hatred for sin is infinite. And therefore, His grief over the sinfulness of our world is infinite. Is God the author of sin? Absolutely not. Did God cause the fall of Adam and Eve? Absolutely not. But is God grieved over the sin of the world? He absolutely is. And is God calling all men to repent of their sin and to get back into alignment with His will? He absolutely is. But now the choice is yours to make. Are you going to submit to the will of God or are you going to rebel against the will of God? Are you going to act according to God's plan and live holy and glorify Him? Or are you going to act contrary to His plan and live for yourself and your own selfish pleasure? You see, the choice is yours to make. God created you as a free moral being, and your character is in your own hands. Who will you be?
What character will you form? What type of behavior will you create? Will you love God or hate God? Will you serve God or serve the devil? The choice is all yours to make.